politics where we take an alternative look at the world of politics and give a voice to the unheard. I'm Peter Kearney and this is the edition for the 26th of April 2017 where the world focus on this show is on Russia and I'm speaking to the editor of Politics First, Dr Marcus Papadopoulos and I talked to him about this idea of Russophobia which may very well exist in the UK particularly in the um, houses in Westminster and in Whitehall. So is there such thing as Russophobia? What is with all of this anti-Russian media coverage or is there something actually to it? So we're going to be talking to Dr. Marcus Papadopoulos, the editor of Politics First on this edition of Bald Politics. But before we get to that, let's have a look at some of the significant happenings on the 26th of April. In 1478, the Patsy family attacked Lorenzo di Medici and kill his brother Giuliano during high mass in Florence Cathedral. In 1865, Union cavalry soldiers corner and shoot dead John Wilkes Booth, the assassin of President Lincoln in Virginia. In 1933, the Gestapo secret police of Nazi Germany are established. And in 1937, the Spanish Civil War Guernica is bombed by the German Luftwaffe. Um, significant births on this date. In 1894, we have Rudolf Hess, the Egyptian-born Nazi politician. Uh, we have John Grierson, who was the Scottish director and producer in 1898. And no connection at all to the Nazis or German bombing of Spain. In 1970, we have the birthday of Melania Trump, the Slovenian-American model, who is the First Lady of the United States, wife of the current President, President Donald J. Trump. So now on to the topic of this show, which is about Russophobia in Westminster in the House of Whitehall, where I speak to Dr. Marcus Papadopoulos, the editor of the Politics First magazine. Wider, Do you think maybe in Europe or in the quote-unquote Western world, are people Russophobic? Are they anti-Russian? Well, I think we have to make a, um, uh, a, a, a distinct difference between ordinary people in the West and, of course, mainstream politicians and mainstream journalists. If we're talking about uh, Britain, well, Russophobia uh, has a long, long history in Whitehall and Westminster. It goes back hundreds of years, um, almost to the time when diplomatic relations were established between uh, London and Moscow. If we talk about uh, Washington, D.C., once again, uh, it has a it has a long history. Um, uh, racism towards Russia, um, uh, stereotyping of Russians, not as long as it does in London, of course, for obvious reasons. But certainly, uh, London and Washington um, uh, are very um, uh, uh, major uh, outposts for anti-Russian hysteria, historically speaking. But when we talk about ordinary people. We have to um, we have to recognise that most people in Britain rely on mainstream media for their information, be it broadcast and print. And because mainstream media in Britain is part of the British establishment, uh, naturally the uh, the coverage that Russia receives at the hands of mainstream media in Britain is going to be very very negative. So. Hmm. British people are going to be uh, heavily influenced by that. So, yes, we can say Russophobia does extend uh, to ordinary British people, uh, but uh, true uh, Russophobia is really confined to Whitehall and Westminster. Mm, okay. And is that something that just hasn't gone away? I mean, you said it's been going on for a long, long time, but does it in, in more recent times it has have does it have its roots in the fact that Russia was predominantly a communist country the UK was predominantly a capitalist country no no it goes back uh, to when it was the Russian Empire it okay. goes back to the 1500s the 1600s and 1700s and so on I think there's a uh, th th there's two components um, when it comes to Russophobia in Britain Historically speaking, we're talking about a, a sense of Anglo-Saxon superiority. 
Um, and secondly, this view that uh, Slavs are naturally disorganized, naturally unintelligent, naturally barbaric, um, meant that, of course, the Russians were going to be uh, targeted uh, by, this, uh, by this British mindset. Mm. And uh, when Russia uh, became communist following the Bolshevik uh, revolution, then uh, that uh, racism uh, in Britain or in Whitehorn, Westminster, uh, simply continued. Mm. It's, it's very interesting because I, um, I often uh, read Hansard, which of course is the, uh, the official um, recording of debates in the Houses of Parliament. And if you have a look at uh, debates on Russia in the House of Commons, say in, in the last few years, compare it to say 100 years ago, 150 years ago, or say 70 years ago, mm. It is very, very similar. The mm. same language is being used in the House of Commons and also in the House of Lords. Mm. Language like Russia is a threat to Europe's uh, freedom, mm. Russia is a threat to Europe's security and stability, and uh, Russian tyranny, Russian authoritarianism mm. is a threat to European democracy. And of course, uh, to British freedom and to British uh, security. Yeah. Uh, so Russophobia uh, was just lying dormant in the 1990s. Uh, why was it lying dormant? Largely because uh, Russia was being ruled uh, by Boris Yeltsin, who of course was fiercely <laughs> Western in his outlook, yeah. was subservient uh, to the IMF, and uh, was, okay. ultimately speaking, treacherous. Okay. Now, some people might say that in, in a modern world, quote-unquote modern world, where we're all very mature, those kind of ancient attitudes couldn't possibly exist anymore, that we see through those uh, racism and so forth. That's all a thing of the past. Um, we couldn't possibly dislike somebody just because they come from a country. And really, wouldn't you not say that politicians, they've got bigger interests than just disliking somebody because of their, because of their ethnic background? Well, I would uh, urge anyone who believes that to simply travel to Westminster, mm. uh, enter the Houses of Parliament, sit in the public gallery when they're discussing Russia, and uh, they will witness for themselves that that, sus that, that sus British suspicion and the hostility and ethnic stereotyping of Russians hasn't gone anywhere. You know, regrettably, racism is a... Uh, it's a fact of life. Um, it's you're never going to be able to eradicate it. Uh, no question about it. And uh, as long as uh, Russia is a powerful country, and uh, as long, of course, as Russia exists, there will always be Russophobia um, in Britain. And let me let me emphasize this. There's some uh, uh, misunderstanding from. On behalf of some people in Britain, that Russophobia is a word which has been invented in the last few years. No, it doesn't. Uh, Russophobia uh, entered the uh, the English lexicon hundreds uh, of years ago, and in fact, uh, there was a major uh, book published on Russophobia in Britain in the late uh, in the late eighteen uh, nineties. Mm. Uh, so it's very important to clarify that. Mm. Okay, so that Russophobia, the the feeling of people in Whitehall and Westminster. Is that what's still carrying through to today, um, anti-Putin rhetoric that we hear, and in particular in relation to Syria? Uh, is it because people are anti-Syrian, or is it because Syria is a friend of Russia? Mm. Well, uh, you know, racism towards Russians is not the only form of racism that you find in Whitehall and Westminster. <laughs> Sadly, you find uh, racism towards Arabs. Uh, as well, and other peoples in the world. You know, the British Empire might not exist anymore, but the mindset uh, from the days of the British Empire continues. It survived the end of the British Empire. Now, I don't necessarily believe that people in Whitehall and Westminster are anti-Syrian, but they're acutely aware that uh, Syria and Russia have for over 50 years been very, very close friends and allies. And that means 
that uh, for people in the British government that uh, Syria uh, through Russia poses a threat to Western dominance of uh, of the Middle East and also uh, to North Africa as well. So that's really what it's uh, what it's about. Mm. And you know, if Russia uh, if if Russia was weak in 2017, if it wasn't if it hadn't been able to come to the assistance of its uh, Syrian ally, if it uh, hadn't been able to uh, forge inroads in Libya and strengthen its relationship in North Korea, then uh, Russophobia wouldn't be so prominent as as it currently is. It it, it would always be there, mm. but it's because Russian power. Uh, Russia has returned to the international arena um, in a very resurgent way. Okay. Um, is that, would this in any way influence Trump's recent attack on Syria? I mean, it seemed for a while, and particularly during his campaign and even after his campaign, that he was going to keep out. Um, mm. is, has there been a Whitehall influence in Washington to get him involved? Well, I think uh, a lot of people uh, now regret having believed what Donald Trump said during his election campaign. I think there was a lot of very naive people out there from ordinary people to political commentators and to some politicians as well. Uh, how you can believe someone who has never held elected office before is a, is a serious populist and opportunist and was making uh, you know, the, the, the biggest statements without really backing it up. And of course, now we see the reality of uh, of Donald Trump. He has said that Russia stole the Crimea and needs to give it back to Ukraine. He's held Russia responsible for the conflict in the Donbass. He's held Russia uh, to be in breach of the INF Treaty. And of course, he has, he has attacked uh, Syria, which of course is the linchpin in the fight against Islamist terrorism. Now, certainly, I believe that whoever sits in the White House in the White House the machines of the American system, of the government, come around that person. Be it Trump, be it uh, Bush, Obama, Clinton, etc. But ultimately, uh, the likes of Obama and Trump, they go along with it. Mm. If Trump, for example, was a principled, moral man who did not put his own interests first, then he would come out publicly and say, I'm being pressurized to pursue an antagonistic policy towards Russia, towards Iran, North Korea, mm. Syria, etc. And I don't want to be a part of that. And I'm resigning. But of course, he's not doing that. It's mm. all about himself. And also, he does hold other countries in the world who threaten American global hegemony uh, to be dangerous countries that need to be put in their place. And he's certainly pursuing that at the moment. That's what his banal, useless slogan of great America, make America great again, actually means in practice, it means making sure American global supremacy cannot be challenged. And I think people now understand that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Why is it, do you think, that when it comes to Syria, um, that in the mainstream media, we could probably understand why in the mainstream media, a lot of it seems to be anti-Syrian, or at least anti-Assad and anti-Putin, uh, it's even to the extent where people say something along the lines of, well, that's Putin or that's Iran and, and, and no further explanation is ever given. Uh, and, and also in some of the left wing uh, media, th there aren't too many friends there either. Uh, there are some, but not, not very many. Um, wh why is that? Is there a global effort against them or uh, are they, uh, do they know something we don't know? Yes, well, I think that if we're talking about um, if we're talking about this left-right division in Britain, at any case, uh, it, it has almost um, disappeared. Um, though, of course, it came back or it has come back since Jeremy Corbyn became leader of the Labour Party. But following the end of the Cold War, that left-right division uh, did uh, did end, and uh, or people on on the left, people on the right, they all went to the centre. Uh, ground. Now, if we're talking uh, specifically about Syria, um, very, very left-wing people, people who would identify themselves as communists, are openly supportive of President Putin, openly supportive of President Assad. So in Britain, the 
uh, the communist newspaper, the Morning Star, has been supporting uh, President Assad since the, uh, the Islamist uprising began in 2011, and it's been supporting President Putin's uh, policy uh, on Syria. But um, newspapers like The Guardian in Britain cannot be described as being on the left. I mean, they're liberal, and there is a difference between left-wing politics and liberal politics. They're very, very different. Now, naturally, um, the right in politics um, uh, is going to be hostile towards Russia. I mean, that's just, that's, that's inevitable. You know, the Conservative Party in Britain is the party of the British establishment, and the British establishment uh, traditionally views Russia in a suspicious, hostile way and regards Russia as a threat to Britain and a threat to British interests uh, in the world. So it was inevitable that um, uh, President Assad and his government were going to be demonised by people on the right in Britain and uh, people who have liberal beliefs in Britain as well. I mean, if we take the, the Labour Party in Britain or the Parliamentary Labour Party, the, the Labour MPs, uh, we can't regard them most of them as being left-wing. I mean, that's just that's just nonsense. Someone like Chaka Ramuna is very, very right-wing. He's ultimately a Blairite. So these people naturally um, are going to have very little sympathy for Russia and uh, for Syria as well. Okay, okay so it's part of, of the establishment. And now some people will say that, I mean, th the argument is that he's a democratically elected leader. He's invited the Russians in. Nobody's invited the Americans in. Uh, some people might say that his electoral system is a little bit of a sham where he gets to appoint quite a number, a large number of the people to the to the parliament. Does that hold any validity? Is that even important in the debate? Well, first of all, no uh, political system, no electoral system is perfect. I mean, let's not forget, no British prime minister achieves 51% of the vote in general elections in Britain. You know, their vote is either 42 or 43 or 44 or 45. Not even Margaret Thatcher and Tony Blair uh, achieved anything near 51%. So what we can say is that Margaret Thatcher in her landslide victory in 1983 and Tony Blair in his landslide victory in 1997 uh, were, as I said, landslide victories. But still, most people in Britain did not vote for Thatcher and did not vote uh, for Tony Blair. Now, uh, the voting system, the political system, the electoral system in Syria is very, very different. And it is not perfect, but most Syrians in uh, presidential elections have voted for President Assad. Whether you like him or not is totally irrelevant. Most Syrians actively or passively support him. Mm -hmm. And under international law, President Assad is the legitimate leader of Syria. Once again, regardless of whether you like him or not, he is the legitimate leader. I bitterly dislike the Saudi royal family, but they are the legitimate leaders of Saudi Arabia. And if we are going to achieve global peace and global uh, stability, then we have to respect international law. I believe Saudi Arabia needs to be exposed at the United Nations for being the leading exporter of Islamic extremism and terrorism to the world. But I don't believe Saudi Arabia should be militarily attacked mm. or covertly attacked, but some action should be taken against Saudi Arabia, but in line with international law. Okay. Now, just to finish, I'm not going to ask you where you see the Syrian conflict ending, um, but what can we expect to see over the next couple of months? Can we expect to see more U.S., Russian involvement, British involvement, or even troops on the ground? Well, of course, there are all, already are American troops on the ground in Syria, in northern Syria, and that is a flagrant uh, violation of Syria's independence and sovereignty because Damascus did not give permission to those American soldiers to be there. I think that Trump's attack on uh, Syria... Uh, set a precedent. Um, uh, it means that another attack by America is likely. Um, uh, the real spotlight will be on Russia and to a lesser extent on Iran to see what their response will be if the Americans attack um, uh, a Syrian military installation with cruise missiles or indeed 
uh, with uh, American uh, military aircraft. I think the only way that the uh, the elect that the uh, fighting in Syria can really end is if uh, the Islamist terrorists receive. Uh, or, or stop receiving their support from their foreign backers in the world, uh, America, Britain, uh, Turkey, Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Um, if they don't, then the war will simply uh, go on and on. And I believe the Syrian government, the Syrian army will be victorious in the end. But how many thousands more people will lose their lives? Mm. Yes, I support the peace talks going on at the moment, though they're not really going on at the moment. Mm. Uh, they're dead because of Trump's attack. Um, but sadly, I, I hold the view, and, and it pains me to have to say this, but I hold the view that the only solution to the conflict in Syria will be a, a military solution. So thank you very much to Dr. Marcus Papadopoulos for joining us on the show. If you want to know a little bit more about him and the magazine that he edits, uh, you can find out more on politicsfirst.org.uk. Um, so that's about it from us on this show on Ball Politics. Thank you very much for joining us and join us again for the next show where we take an alternative look at the world of politics and give a voice to the unheard.